Good afternoon. Welcome to Monday. You all heard this from the secretary this morning, but I think it bears repeating, and that is we strongly condemn the Burmese military's executions of pro-democracy activists and elected leaders. These heinous acts of violence demonstrate the regime's brutality in a new and horrible light, and we remain concerned it also reflects an ongoing disregard for the human rights and rule of law. As reports indicate, the activists were denied legal representation and the ability to appeal. The United States urges all partners and allies to join us in condemning the regime's actions and stepping up pressure on the regime and its supporters. We call on the regime to cease executions, release all those unjustly detained, and restore Burma's path to democracy. With that, take your questions. All right, well, I wasn't going to start with that, but I will now. Um, so what are you going to do about it? Well, um, obviously, this is um, uh, just transpired in, in recent hours. We have been in touch uh, with our partners around the world, to include our partners in ASEAN. Uh, we are urging, as I said just a moment ago, uh, all countries, all partners, all allies uh, to add their voices uh, when it comes to the condemnation uh, of this heinous affront to the rule of law, this heinous affront to human rights, uh, this heinous affront to the Burmese people who have, since February of last year, uh, expressed an ardent and sincere desire uh, to put their country on the path back to democracy. At the same time, uh, we are urging all of our partners to step up that economic pressure, that political pressure uh, on the regime in Burma. Uh, not only is this an affront to the human rights uh, of the Burmese people, not only is it a slap in the face uh, to the millions of Burmese who wish to see their country back on the path to democracy, it's also a direct rebuke of the appeal that the junta heard and the world heard uh, from the ASEAN chair, Cambodia, uh, in this case, and other ASEAN leaders who warned the junta in no uncertain terms not to carry out these executions. Uh, we underscore that uh, with the escalating violence, with these uh, horrific atrocities that the junta has carried out, uh, there can be no business as usual with this uh, regime. We urge all countries to ban the sale of military equipment to Burma, to refrain from lending uh, the regime any degree of international credibility, uh, and we call on ASEAN uh, to maintain its important precedent, uh, only allowing Burmese non-political representation uh, at regional events. Okay. So what are you going to do? Well, oh, so what is the Biden administration? We, we all, we are already uh, responding to this. I said we've been in close touch uh, with our partners, including our ASEAN partners. I think you will see uh, more from us and from our partners in terms of condemnation. And we've made clear all along since February of last year that the costs on the Burmese regime, the costs on the junta will continue to escalate. We will continue uh, to escalate uh, those costs uh, with the economic pressure uh, that we have imposed and that we're prepared to impose. Uh, we, of course, don't preview uh, our own sanctions, uh, but all options that serve to cut off the regime's revenue, uh, which it uses to perpetrate this violence, it's on the table. Uh, we, when considering any such actions, we're of course looking to any potential humanitarian implications for the people of Burma who have already suffered far too much for far too long uh, since this junta came to power. But again, all options are on the table. We're going to work with uh, our partners uh, to see to it that uh, the steps we take going forward are coordinated so that they have maximum effect on the regime. Okay. But do you, do you think that condemnation, which you've just called for again and which you've asked for all your partners and allies to join in is, en and is enough? It's not enough. It is, it is not enough, and it's certainly not the totality of our response. Uh, our response uh, include, includes uh, the statements that you've heard, the statements that uh, you will hear uh, from the United States and our, and our partners, but uh, the economic measures, the political measures, the diplomatic uh, measures, uh, and the very clear call uh, that we have put out to partners around the world uh, that it cannot be business as usual with the junta. Just to follow up on that, do you um, <clears throat> do you have any partners to step up? I think you know a lot of activists, a lot of Myanmar people have been asking for you 
for the US government to step up uh, in terms of its response for a long time in that, you know, you've done a lot of sanctions, but you haven't done any sanctions that target the, the gas uh, exports that are you know, the main source of for foreign revenue for uh, the hunter. So, you know, why, why haven't you taken any action on that if you're, you know, asking for not to be business as, as usual for, for you know, the hunter? You know, why haven't you taken any action on, on, the, on these gas revenues and, and will you do that now? All means all. Uh, when I say that all options are on the table, I mean that all options are on the table. We are discussing additional response options that we could implement uh, ourselves, that we could implement, implement in coordination uh, with our partners, uh, our partners in ASEAN, our other like-minded partners uh, with whom we've worked since February of last year to seek to put Burma back, back on the path to uh, democracy. Even as we consider all of those measures, uh, we are also cognizant uh, of what needs to be a central charge, and that is to do no harm or to do no additional harm in this case. It's clear uh, that the coup has done tremendous harm uh, to the people of uh, Burma, hundreds of whom have been killed in this senseless violence, um, too many of whom find themselves political prisoner uh, of a regime that uh, isn't tolerating any form uh, of dissent or opposition. So uh, as we consider our next steps, as we consider all potential options, we are also taking a very close look at any potential humanitarian implications uh, of steps that we might take. You're talking about enhancing support uh, for, for the Burmese people. Obviously, a lot of the Burmese people have taken up arms against their, against the, the, the hunter. Um, you know, do, you, do you still draw the line on, on you know, military support for the opposition to, to the hunter? And is that something you're going to consider? We are seeking to put Burma on the path back to democracy. Uh, our goal in this is a political one. Our goal in this uh, is to help advance uh, the same objective and the same goal uh, that we've heard the people of Burma, uh, so many of whom have taken peacefully to the streets to demonstrate uh, their support uh, for a return to democracy. It's our goal to support them, and we will continue uh, to support them uh, with uh, uh, with appropriate means. What, what if other countries, allies, partners uh, were to offer support for, for military opponents? Would you, would you be against that? Uh, again, our goal is a return to democracy. Uh, a uh, protracted conflict, a protracted civil war uh, would not be in anyone's interest, not the least uh, the people of Burma. Just to clarify, we say in all measures are on the table. We talk about economic, diplomatic means. Correct. Um, when um, uh, you said that all countries need to condemn and, and take action. Uh, can you talk to the role of, um, of some of the, the major players, including China in particular, uh, India to a certain extent, that haven't, um, haven't completely uh, distanced themselves from the country? Well, now is the time, uh, because you were right, Sean, in your question that there are countries around the world that uh, haven't done enough, certainly, when it comes to rhetorical condemnation, when it, when it comes to imposing costs, uh, when it comes to the court charge. Uh, that it cannot be business as usual with the junta. Uh, we have discussed uh, the goal of putting Burma back on the path to democracy with virtually all of our allies and partners in the region. Uh, there are some countries in the region, you named a couple of them, uh, where we have had in-depth discussions. When uh, the secretary met with Wang Yi uh, not all that long ago, uh, Burma was a topic of discussion. We've discussed it. Uh, with other senior PRC officials, arguably no country, uh, has the potential to influence the trajectory uh, of Burma's next steps more so than the PRC. And we've called on all countries uh, to act responsibly, to use their influence in a way that is constructive, to use their influence in a way uh, that works for the interests of the Burmese people, uh, and then ultimately uh, puts Burma back on the path uh, to democracy. The fact is uh, that the regime has not faced the level of economic and, in some cases, diplomatic pressure uh, that we would like to see. Uh, we are calling on uh, countries around the world uh, to do more. Uh, we will be doing more as well. Can we go to a different topic? There's something else also more on uh, Russia. Um, there, in Ukraine. there was a statement that the Secretary made on Saturday um, regarding the strike in Odessa. Um, just following up on that, does the United States believe this was a violation of the agreement reached in Turkey? 
Uh, so you saw the statement from uh, the secretary uh, over the weekend, uh, as, as he alluded to at the time, Russia's brazen attack against the port city of Odessa uh, only 24, afters, 24 hours after uh, this agreement was uh, signed. It certainly undermines uh, the credibility um, of Russia's commitments to the other parties to this deal, uh, the United Nations, Turkey, and Ukraine. Uh, as well as its broader humanitarian commitment that it made in the July 21st agreement. Uh, it also highlights, we believe, uh, that Moscow continues to behave in ways that intentionally uh, prevent desperately needed food from reaching uh, many of the world's uh, most poor, uh, those who are suffering um, the most acute effects uh, of the food insecurity that Moscow's invasion of Ukraine has uh, exacerbated. Uh, despite these attacks, we do understand that the parties are, are continuing preparations to open Ukraine's Black Sea ports for food and for fertilizer exports. Uh, we are clear-eyed uh, going forward, uh, but we also continue to expect uh, that the Black Sea Agreement will be, implement, uh, be implemented. Uh, we know that the world will be watching, as you heard from the Secretary, uh, we will be working with our partners around the world uh, to see to it that Moscow is held accountable uh, for the agreement it reached. <clears throat> uh, and that's why we'll continue to remain in close coordination with uh, President Zelensky, uh, the government of Ukraine, the Secretary General, uh, our Turkish allies, uh, who were instrumental uh, in bringing this agreement to conclusion. Can I follow on this? So, uh, so, so you think this agreement will end war? I mean, and despite uh, this attack and possibly similar attacks uh, in the future. That's how you see it. It's enduring. It, 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 this agreement needs to endure. Uh, the people throughout the world, uh, whether it's in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, uh, parts of the Indo-Pacific, uh, who have suffered the worst consequences of food insecurity that Moscow's invasion of Ukraine uh, has ex exacerbated, uh, it needs to endure for their benefit. Uh, we uh, have heard from the parties that they're moving forward with preparations uh, to see an initial uh, tranche of food and fertilizer move out uh, in the coming days. It is certainly uh, our hope that that happens. But again, we're also uh, clear eyed. Uh, we acknowledge that Moscow's track record when it comes to previous deals that it has struck uh, is not exactly a cause for optimism. It harkens back to what we heard and what we saw from Russia uh, in the context of the humanitarian corridors uh, that were to have been open for evacuations of uh, civilians and others uh, from besieged cities. In some cases, those humanitarian corridors were open uh, for just a few days, or in some cases, just a few hours uh, before Moscow appeared to renege on its agreement. In this case, uh, it's very clear that Moscow, uh, as one of my colleagues uh, put it last week, uh, has felt uh, the heat of global opprobrium uh, because the world uh, now knows, it is now clear, that rising food prices, rising energy prices, food insecurity uh, more broadly, has been exacerbated uh, by, uh, in recent months, one cause more than any other, and that is Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, it's very clear that Russia has felt the pressure. We, for those of, uh, of you who were with us in Bali, Indonesia, uh, the other week for the G20 foreign ministers meeting, uh, any of you saw this up close. Uh, the only walkout from the G20 uh, was uh, not by uh, the United States, not by any one of our allies and partners, uh, but by Foreign Minister Lavrov, who after sitting through a number of statements of strong condemnation, a number of statements of strong concern from countries around the world uh, who have felt the acute pain of this growing food insecurity, uh, determined that he had heard enough, uh, and he left the session, before the session, in fact, uh, on global food insecurity. Uh, so it's clear that the world has uh, been able to speak um, with uh, largely with one voice on this. We will continue. Uh, to do what we can to support the UN, to support our Turkish allies, because we know the importance uh, of this grain, of this fertilizer, uh, reaching global markets. So you said last week that uh, uh, Russian grain is not in any way sanctioned, or there are no sanctions. That's right. 
But the Russians claim that there are secondary sanctions that impact their ability to export their grain and so on. On the, the Russians have made a number of claims uh, in recent days, but also uh, over recent months in the context of Russia and, and Ukraine uh, that amount to nothing more uh, than misinformation or in some cases disinformation. The fact is uh, that we have been very specific in designing this sanctions regime uh, to see to it that food and fertilizer from Russia is entirely exempted to see to it that companies around the world have the assurances that they need uh, to export these products, uh, knowing uh, the vital role that uh, Ukraine's grain, Ukraine's fertilizer, uh, fertilizer and food from uh, the region plays, uh, given that it is essentially a breadbasket for the world. So Ned, you keep saying this, making this comment about the Russians being isolated and Lavrov walking out of the, the, the G20. You know, the guy just got off a, has just finished up a five or four or five country tour of, of Africa, starting in Egypt, going to Ethiopia, and Uganda, and Congo. Uh, that's not exactly a picture of isolation, is it? Matt, we, um, I think you were you were there. Um, you you saw and you heard some of the messages uh, that emanated from uh, the G20. The G20 being a, a fairly a diverse cross-section uh, of countries with uh, diverse interests and perspectives, uh, but there was a broad consensus uh, among this collection of countries, some of the world's leading economies, uh, that Russia uh, should be condemned for its actions, uh, that its actions were exacerbating and perpetuating uh, the, global, uh, the global food process, uh, crisis. Um, the, it is becoming clear that Russia is recognizing uh, that its own actions have caused it to become a pariah. I made a, an allusion uh, so, to this a moment ago, but... Uh, so you're saying that these trips that, that, that they're, I mean, the, the defense minister was just in Turkey, right, signing this agreement. Now, what happened in Odessa happened in, in Odessa, but I mean, he, he went there. President Putin was just in Iran. Okay, fine, it's Iran. And you, you might say that, okay, that shows desperation, but... So you're, so you're saying that all these foreign visits that they're doing are signs of desperation of Russians, Russia's increasing isolation because it, it, it doesn't really compute that way. He, it's very clear uh, that Foreign Minister Lavrov is seeking to engage uh, with countries to try to, to try to stem uh, the onslaught of outrage against Russia. We've made this point before. Uh, we are much less concerned with whom Russia is speaking and the messages that Russia is hearing uh, from countries. The message that Foreign Minister Lavrov heard, the message that uh, Russia heard from the G20, the message that Russia uh, has heard from the UN, uh, the message that Russia has heard uh, from other countries, other blocks of countries, uh, has been increasingly clear uh, about the toll of Moscow's invasion, the toll of Moscow's uh, brutal aggression against Ukraine. May I follow on train? Uh, sure, please. Um, Ambassador Power told CNN today that the U.S. administration is preparing so-called Plan B, means alternative plan to transport grain from Ukraine. Could you provide more details, and does it mean that uh, we need this plan in case if Istanbul agreement will not work, or it will be realized at the same time? So we are looking at all options when it comes to the disposition of uh, Ukrainian grain, and we're working with our Ukrainian partners uh, who are, uh, in the first instance, uh, responsible for uh, seeing the export uh, of their grain, because it is, again, their grain. Uh, the, it is clear that opening Ukraine's Black Sea ports would be the most effective means by which uh, to increase uh, exports of Ukrainian grain and other foodstuffs. Uh, we've made this point before, but there are some 20 tons of grain uh, that are uh, in Ukraine's Black Sea ports ready to go have been ready to go for, in some cases, months, uh, and they have been stuck there owing uh, principally uh, to one element and one element alone, uh, that is Russia's blockade of the Black Sea. But all along, uh, we've made the point that we are looking at and helping our Ukrainian partners with every option uh, to increase uh, Ukrainian grain exports. Uh, and in fact, prior to uh, the signing of this deal, Ukraine's grain exports have increased somewhat uh, given uh, the use of overland routes, uh, given other tactics that our Ukrainian partners have put into play. 
before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine was exporting some uh, six tons uh, of grain per month. Uh, Ukraine is nowhere near that uh, at the present. At the present, excuse me. Uh, but Ukraine's exports have increased month over month from February to March to April to May uh, and in subsequent months. Uh, so we have been able to work with them uh, in, um, to increase those exports in some ways, but we all know uh, that the most effective means and the largest scale means by which to increase those exports will be through the blast. Sean. Uh, could I just, uh, this follows up on, on Sayed's question a bit, but uh, specifically Lavrov was in, uh, in Cairo addressing the Arab League. Um, you said that uh, the Arab League to, to supply grain from, uh, from Russia. To, uh, to, to Egypt and to other countries, and also blaming the United States for, uh, for the impediments there, saying it disrupted the supply chain. Do you have any uh, either reaction to his remarks or the fact that he's speaking there at the Arab League? Well, let me just say uh, broadly uh, about his remarks, which I, I had a chance to see. Uh, it is a reflection of the fact that virtually every single day, senior Russian officials are putting to the lie just about everything we heard from Moscow before the start of the invasion on February 24th. Uh, we consistently heard, and I'm sure many of you remember this, uh, emanate from the Kremlin that what was then a, a military buildup uh, and ultimately the incursion uh, was, as Moscow would, would, would tell you, uh, the result of some perceived threat from some imagined enemy. Uh, we heard it was Ukraine. We heard it was NATO. We heard it was the United States. Uh, we heard it was the West. Uh, we, have cur we, of course, called that a lie at the time uh, because it was. Uh, but now, months into this brutal uh, war of aggression, I think it's fair to say that the Russians are doing as good a job of uh, perhaps anyone uh, in highlighting their own duplicity and putting to the lie, as I said before, uh, just about everything we heard prior uh, to the invasion. Uh, just yesterday, and you referenced this, Sean, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov said Moscow's overarching goal in Ukraine was to free the Ukrainian people from its quote-unquote unacceptable regime, uh, expressing, as one news account put it, uh, Russia's war aims in some of the bluntest terms yet. Uh, he said that uh, in front of the Arab League in a region where, coincidentally, uh, Russia has, at least previously, uh, tried to spew uh, disinformation uh, and propagated misinformation to the contrary. Last week, once again, Foreign Minister Lavrov, he did precisely the same thing. He said publicly what we have always known, uh, saying that Russia's quote unquote ge geographical goals uh, in Ukraine go well beyond the Donbass. They include Kherson, they include Zaporizhia, they include, include other sovereign regions uh, of Ukraine. But it hasn't only been Foreign Minister Lavrov. Earlier this year, uh, you've heard uh, Secretary Blinken allude to this previously, but President Putin himself, uh, compared himself to Peter the Great and said that, uh, as the secretary reminded all of us, uh, when Peter waged war with Sweden, uh, he was simply taking back what belonged uh, to Russia. Uh, President Putin went on to say that uh, now Russia is doing more than doing nothing more uh, than to seek to take back uh, what is uh, purportedly theirs. Uh, in a strange way, uh, I think, again, uh, it's fair to say that the Russians have become uh, some of uh, the best debunkers of uh, their own lies, of their own uh, propaganda. Uh, they're now telling the world what has been clear for some time, uh, that this is nothing more than a war of territorial conquest. Uh, so that's why uh, throughout this, we have sought to seek to, we, we have sought to galvanize uh, the international community uh, to stand up, uh, knowing that Anytime uh, the rules-based international order is undermined anywhere, uh, it's eroded everywhere. And the Russians have been telling us in very clear terms that's precisely what they're seeking On the to international do. order, I'm sorry, but did you hear what Putin said last week? He was in, in some sort of a, a conference uh, akin to the Aspen uh, Institute, and he said that basically the old world, world order has collapsed. There's you know, the world is ready for a new world. I mean, you know, yeah. I assume he was referring to the one begun under <coughs> George Herbert Walker Bush in 1990. Uh, the same rules-based international order that has uh, enabled countries uh, like Russia, uh, like some of its current partners, uh, to, um, uh, to experience uh, growth, uh, to come into the international system, to 
uh, enjoy uh, economic integration, to enjoy uh, political integration, uh, all until President Putin uh, decided to put an end to that and to undo 30 years of economic integration uh, to uh, make Russia uh, an outcast uh, from uh, the global uh, community of countries. Uh, so, yes, this has been a system uh, that has fueled over the course of not only 30 years, but really going back to uh, the end of the Second World War, uh, some eight decades of unprecedented levels of stability, of security, of prosperity, uh, the spread of uh, democracy as well. Uh, the fact is that uh, this is an international system uh, that has benefited uh, countries around the world, uh, including the countries that are seeking to challenge it. And in many cases, it's not an exaggeration to say uh, the countries that are posing the most acute uh, challenge to it. Jane. Thank you, Nate. Uh, uh, I have a question on Russia and North Korea. Uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov announced uh, recently Western countries were opposed to uh, peace talks with Ukraine. Is this true? Uh, that is absolutely not true. Uh, President Zelensky uh, has said very clearly that this war will have to end diplomatically. We know this war will have to end through diplomacy, uh, through dialogue. Uh, what is also true is that uh, the Russians have shown no indication whatsoever that they are prepared to engage in uh, constructive dialogue, in constructive diplomacy. You don't have to take our word for it. Uh, just about uh, every world leader uh, that has spoken to President Putin has in some cases said publicly, in some cases uh, conveyed to us privately, uh, that there seems to be no room on the part of the Russian Federation uh, for any sort of real uh, negotiation, the kind of negotiation that the Ukrainians uh, have been uh, willing uh, to take part in uh, since the beginning uh, of this uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm reminded uh, of another lie uh, that we heard emanate from the Kremlin, that peace talks were ongoing uh, in March only to have uh, what the Russians claimed was a Ukrainian withdrawal uh, from them. Uh, the great irony, of course, is that uh, it is Russia, not Ukraine, uh, that is responsible for perpetrating uh, this brutality uh, against the Ukrainian people, uh, that is responsible for uh, the continued bombardment, the conti continued military operations on sovereign uh, Ukrainian soil, and it's uh, Ukraine's leadership, including President Zelensky, that is consistently said they are, uh, they recognize this will have to end diplomatically, uh, and they are, are prepared to engage uh, diplomatically. Uh, Russia could not say the same. On North Korea, recently, uh, uh, National Security Council also said that uh, North Korea is exploiting funds through ransomware hacking. How is the United States responding to this cyber hacking, I mean, cyber hacking uh, criminal groups? We have spoken quite a bit in this briefing room, and you've heard from other senior officials. Uh, our profound concerns, the international community's profound concerns with uh, the DPRK's WMD programs, uh, but that is not the extent uh, of the challenge uh, that the DPRK poses to the international community and its activities uh, in cyberspace uh, are another uh, such challenge. Uh, we have released information indicating some of these uh, nefarious and malign activities uh, that the DPRK regime is undertaking online in some cases. Uh, to raise funds that go towards its illicit WMD programs. Uh, we have used the uh, suite of policy tools at our disposal, um, be it economic, be it political, uh, be it law enforcement tools as well, uh, to pursue those uh, actors from the DPRK uh, who are responsible for this, just as we have used some of those same uh, suite of tools uh, to go after those uh, responsible for the proliferation of the DPRK's WMD programs. Yes. Uh, I have a couple of questions. And at the first, on Tunisia, do you have any comment or uh, reaction to the referendum on the institution? 
Well, the uh, voting is still ongoing, as I understand it. So we're awaiting the official referendum outcome based on the independent high authority for elections in Tunisia. Uh, as we've always affirmed, it is up to the Tunisian people to decide their political future, and we'll continue to stand uh, with them, with the Tunisian people, calling for a return to responsive, transparent, and accountable democratic governance uh, that respects human rights and prioritizes uh, the country's economic future. And uh, on uh, the special envoy to the Horn of Africa, uh, Michael Lambert's uh, meetings in Cali, uh, the, in Ethiopia, do you have any details? Well, he uh, has just arrived in the region. I believe we put out a, um, a statement, a short statement yesterday announcing uh, that he would travel to Egypt, the UAE, and to Ethiopia uh, from July 24th. Yesterday uh, through a week from today, August 1st, uh, he'll, uh, during that trip, uh, provide continuing U.S. support uh, towards forging a diplomatic resolution to issues related to the Grand Ethiopian Resistance uh, Renaissance, Renaissance Dam, or GERD. Uh, that would achieve the interests of all the parties and contribute to a more peaceful and prosperous region. Uh, in uh, Ethiopia, he will also consult with the AU uh, under whose auspices GERD talks uh, occur. Uh, he will also have an opportunity in Ethiopia to review uh, the progress on delivery of humanitarian assistance, accountability for human rights violations and abuses, as well as efforts to advance peace talks uh, between the Ethiopian government and Tigrayan authorities. Uh, and as you know, uh, he will affirm what we have consistently said, and that's that we remain committed to advancing diplomatic efforts in support of an inclusive political process towards lasting peace, security, and prosperity for all the people of Ethiopia. And do you expect uh, Special Envoy Amos uh, Augustine to go back to the region uh, soon to resume talks between Lebanon and Israel? As you know, the special, uh, the senior advisor uh, in this capacity, um, Amos Hochstein, was uh, in the region uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, he was in both Lebanon and Israel to uh, continue efforts to seek to uh, narrow uh, the gaps and to advance some of the progress uh, we've seen on the uh, maritime uh, uh, border issues. That means is he going? I, I just don't have any travel to uh, to speak to at the moment. And my last uh, question on Iran, after the uh, phone call between the French uh, president and the Iranian president, do you expect uh, any uh, steps regarding the talks uh, between the U.S. and Iran? Well, it's difficult for me to say um, because uh, the fact is that uh, it is the onus is on Iran uh, to come forward. Uh, to make clear that Tehran uh, is uh, ready to engage constructively, to put aside extraneous issues, uh, and to talk uh, in good faith about the deal that has been on the table for some time. Uh, the Elysee put out uh, a, a statement, made clear that uh, President Macron of France uh, conveyed precisely the same message uh, we have conveyed indirectly uh, to the Iranians, the same message we have issued uh, publicly for some time. We are prepared uh, to re-enter on a mutual basis uh, the JCPOA, uh, but of course uh, mutual means it's a two-way street. Uh, the Iranians would need to do the same. Uh, we have not yet, at least to date, uh, seen the Iranians indicate uh, that they're ready to do that. Ted, follow up? Uh, let me even take a follow up. Let me take a follow up and then we'll come back. Thank you. Um, the head of Iran's Atomic Energy Agency today said that they're not going to allow the IAEA uh, cameras to operate until the uh, the deal is uh, restored. Could that have any impact on the negotiations? Well, uh, we talked about this uh, in recent weeks, and we noted last month uh, that Iran's decision to turn off uh, multiple JCPOA-related IAEA cameras uh, responding to the very clear call that Iran heard from the international community uh, for more transparency by offering only uh, less transparency uh, was extremely regrettable, uh, to put it mildly. It was uh, the latest uh, in a series of uh, such steps. Uh, we know, and the, the fact is that maintaining uh, reduced JCPOA-related transparency with the IAEA uh, only complicates uh, the challenges uh, associated with a potential mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. Uh, it only deepens uh, the nuclear crisis that Iran itself has created. Uh, when it comes to potential implications, um, as part of any negotiated uh, mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA, 
uh, Iran will have to provide whatever information and transparency uh, the IAEA deems necessary to allow it to verify Iran's JCPOA uh, declarations. Um, as we've said, we'll continuously uh, reassess the nonproliferation benefits of the JCPOA, as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago. Uh, we will continue to pursue a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA for as long as that assessment uh, is, uh, uh, makes clear uh, that a mutual return to compliance uh, would be in our national security interest. That is to say that a mutual return to compliance would put us in a stronger position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran's uh, nuclear program uh, than we're in today. You say that you want them to drop um, their um, non-JCPOA demands. Iran keeps saying that it's uh, that the U.S. Uh, administration has to make a decision, has to make a decision, a political decision. What exactly is that decision that they're expecting of you? Because the administration, the negotiators, should know what Iran wants from them. They're not saying exactly. So. I, I will let the Iranians uh, air uh, publicly what it is uh, they are referring to with that. Uh, the fact is that we have made a political decision. Uh, we made a political decision early on in this administration. In fact, it was a political decision that the then uh, candidate Biden articulated on the campaign trail. Uh, that is to say that if Iran were to reenter uh, the JCPOA, we would do the same. After months of painstaking discussions, uh, there is an agreement that has been on the table, uh, an agreement that essentially hammers out uh, the logistics and the details of doing so. Uh, the fact is, we made that decision a long time ago. Uh, the Iranians, if they are serious about a mutual return to compliance, which they may not be, uh, it is the onus is now on them uh, to take that deal. So what is your assessment? And you keep saying they want to or they don't want to. I'm sure that you have an assessment whether Iran is pursuing this in good faith, they really want to or not. Otherwise, why keep beating the dead horse? Well, if you feel that they're not doing it. The, the Iranians certainly, certainly haven't done anything uh, in uh, recent weeks to suggest uh, that they are eager to re-enter the deal. And in fact, uh, every day that they drag their feet or every day uh, that is filled with uh, nothing but silence on their end, it's an indication to us that uh, they are not serious. Uh, and that they are not ready uh, to re-enter uh, the JCPOA on a mutual basis. Uh, for our part, we are not dragging our feet. We're doing uh, a couple things. Uh, number one, we are working with our uh, allies and partners in the context of the P5 plus one, but also more broadly uh, to uh, determine if there is an opportunity to uh, return to mutual compliance with the JCPOA. And we're, we're pursuing that for a reason uh, that is extraordinarily simple. Uh, and that is because it is still in our interest uh, to do so. In the background, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we're always conducting those technical assess assessments to determine uh, when we might reach the point, and we will reach the point uh, when the deal is no longer uh, in our interest. But uh, we are clear-eyed uh, about uh, the circumstances. Uh, we are clear-eyed uh, uh, about our Iranian interlocutors. Uh, and that's why for some time we have been preparing equally uh, for scenarios in which there is a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA and a, a scenario in which there is not a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. That was a focus of President Biden's trip to Israel, and to Saudi Arabia, where he also had an opportunity to meet with uh, leaders of the GCC plus three. Uh, but these are discussions that we've been having uh, for some time. Can I ask a quick question sure. on the Palestinian issue? Uh, the Times of Israel reported that the, administration, the Biden administration is leaning on the on PAA President Mahmoud Abbas to join or you know, laud or speak well of the uh, Abraham Accords and that it would hurt Palestine. Could you clarify this point for us? Well, what I can say, and you heard this very clearly from Secretary Blinken and uh, from his counterparts uh, in the Negev uh, summit uh, when we traveled to the Negev desert. Uh, in March. Uh, and Secretary Blinken, for his part, um, uh, said that we have to be essentially clear uh, that regional peace agreements and the construction of bridges between Israel uh, and its uh, Arab neighbors is not a substitute for progress between Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, that is a message that we heard uh, in the Negev. It is a message that we've heard 
uh, since from uh, other signatories to the Abraham Accords and to normalization agreements, uh, acknowledging uh, that uh, the onus is on all of us to continue to strive uh, for a world in which uh, Israelis and Palestinians enjoy equal levels of uh, security, of prosperity, of freedom, uh, of dignity. Uh, so we uh, unequivocally uh, support the Abraham Accords. We unequivocally support uh, normalization agreements. Uh, as you know, we've made, made no secret of the fact that we are looking to uh, expand the circle of uh, friendships and relationships between Israel uh, and uh, its neighbors, uh, just as we continue uh, to do everything we can in many cases uh, with uh, our partners in the region and beyond. Uh, to support the aspirations and support the needs of the Palestinian people. You know, I remember when you guys were a bit reluctant to even call it the Abraham Accord, but having said that, I mean, there has been some sort of mutual recognition between the PLO and Israel that goes back almost 30 years, 29 years. So how how do you expect, I mean, what mechanism did, say, the Palestinians joining the Abraham Accord take? How do you see it? That is different than what they have. I, I don't know that anyone is calling for that uh, at the moment, Saeed. Uh, what we are doing is uh, just as we work to reinforce and to expand uh, this set of normalization agreements broadly uh, between Israel and, uh, and its neighbors, uh, we are working towards uh, those objectives that I outlined just a moment ago for uh, the Palestinian people, uh, a Palestinian people uh, that is, enable, is able to enjoy, uh, again, equal levels of prosperity, of security, uh, of dignity, uh, and freedom as their Israeli neighbors. Yes. Do you have anything that you can preview for the US economic two plus two later this week? Uh, what will be the primary focus for the discussions? Uh, there have been some reports that human rights safeguards in supply chains will be an issue. Um, I assume that refers to China's role in supply chains in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, could you comment on that specifically as well? Well, today is Monday. Uh, this is now uh, slated to take place at the end of the week, so uh, I don't want to get ahead of, uh, of where we are, but we do look forward to uh, welcoming our Japanese allies uh, to the building later in the week. We'll do so in tandem uh, with our partners from the Department of Com Commerce to have a wide-ranging discussion uh, on our economic relationship and our economic priorities. Uh, I can uh, uh, assure you that supply chains uh, will feature into that conversation, but we'll wait for later in the week to, to uh, go further into that. Shannon. Uh, Brittany Brenner is back in court tomorrow. Can you give us the latest on the department's involvement in her case and uh, including any recent consular access? So this is something that, uh, is, as you've heard from us consistently, is an absolute priority for Secretary Blinken. It is an absolute priority with, for uh, Ambassador Karstens, our special pres presidential envoy for hostage affairs with whom Secretary Blinken meets uh, regularly, uh, we just as we do uh, with Paul Whelan, uh, we are working around the clock, uh, behind the scenes, quietly, uh, to do everything we possibly can uh, to see to it uh, that Brittany Griner's ordeal, just as uh, Paul Whelan's ordeal, uh, is put to an end uh, just as soon as can be possibly managed. Uh, it is not something that we talk about uh, for obvious reasons. I may have, I've made the point before that uh, in the weeks preceding uh, the release of Trevor Reed, uh, it is not something that we talked about uh, in any detail, but that did not diminish the activity that was ongoing behind the scenes uh, to see to it uh, that uh, Trevor Reed was brought home uh, and we are working constantly uh, behind the scenes to see to it that Brittany Griner, Paul Whelan, and Americans who were unjustly detained uh, around the world uh, can be uh, brought home. In terms of uh, our embassy's involvement, as you know, they have carefully monitored uh, her trial. Our charge uh, was uh, present at her last hearing. I have uh, every expectation that the charge uh, will be there uh, at uh, the next hearing tomorrow as well. Uh, our charge and senior embassy officials have been able to speak to Brittany Griner in the context uh, of those court appearances. Uh, in some cases, uh, Brittany Griner has passed on specific messages. In one case, um, asking our charge to uh, pass on her request uh, that uh, all of those here in this country who are, um, whose attention is, is so trained on her case to keep the faith. Uh, and that is a message that uh, we did in, pass, in fact uh, pass on publicly. 
Uh, yes, Sam. Um, on uh, Rwanda, um, <clears throat> I know you don't usually comment on uh, congressional um, correspondence, but um, I wonder if, we, if I could ask sort of broadly on the, the, the US policy towards Rwanda um, in the light of uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Chair Menendez's uh, letter, which highlights um, the concerns about human rights and, and political repression in Rwanda. He, talk, he basically says the US can no longer um, look the other way as Rwanda ferments rebellion and violence in other parts of the continent, you know, referring to the DRC, um, and also highlights the case of Paul Recessor Vagina, who was a US permanent resident who's detained there. Um, you know, what's, what's your response to this kind of questioning of the US support for the Rwandan government? You know, you're a major donor, I think you're the, the largest donor to that government. You know, do you, do you agree with those concerns? Well, you're right that we don't comment publicly on congressional correspondence. In this case, I have seen that the senator's office has uh, spoken publicly uh, to the letter with which I'm uh, familiar. I have every expectation that Rwanda will be a topic of discussion uh, between the United States, uh, between the uh, Department of State uh, and our um, uh, congressional partners. It is absolutely the prerogative uh, of Congress uh, in pursuing and conducting its oversight role uh, to ask uh, questions of our, uh, of our policy, uh, our policy that is always responsive to uh, events on the ground. Uh, and so, of course, we are uh, taking a close eye uh, to events on the ground, including uh, tensions between the DRC and Rwanda. We've said before that uh, we're concerned about the rising tensions between the DRC uh, and Rwanda. We've urged both sides to exercise restraint and to engage in immediate dialogue uh, to de-escalate tensions and hostilities. Uh, we've made clear uh, the fact that we continue to uh, support the uh, Nairobi process uh, as an effort to uh, de-escalate these tensions. But when it comes to Paul versus Zabinga, uh, this gets back to the last question, uh, but we do have no higher priority uh, to seeing the release of uh, those uh, Americans who were held unjustly uh, anywhere uh, around the world, uh, and that includes Paul versus Zabinga uh, in Rwanda. This is a case that uh, Roger Carson's, Ambassador Carson's, uh, and his office are uh, working on. We've renewed our call for the, for the Rwandan government uh, to address uh, procedural uh, shortcomings in its judicial process. Uh, we're aware of the serious concerns about uh, Paul's uh, health. We continue to urge uh, the government of Rwanda to ensure he receives all uh, necessary uh, medical uh, care. Uh, we have uh, concluded for some time now there were violations of his uh, fair trial uh, guarantees as well. And in light of all that, um, you, you, you don't think that the, the level of aid that, that the U.S. gives to Rwanda is inappropriate? Well, this is something that we always uh, take a look at. It's something that we consult closely um, with our uh, congressional partners with as well. Uh, yes? I just want to ask on House Speaker Pelosi's potential trip to Taiwan. I'm just wondering if there's anything uh, you could tell us about the State Department's analysis around the, the timing of the trip, uh, anything on the, the messaging or threats that we've heard from the Chinese Foreign Ministry about a potential response or the grave impact it might have on uh, U.S.-China relations, uh, and anything else about the, the sort of diplomatic fallout we might see if, if such a trip was to, to go forward. Well, it's impossible for me to, to speak to some of those elements for the very reason that the Speaker's office has uh, not confirmed any travel or potential travel. Well, of course, uh, refer to uh, the office of the speaker uh, for any uh, travel she may uh, undertake. When it comes to what we've heard publicly from uh, the PRC, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, in this case, I'm not going to respond uh, directly, but uh, I will just restate our policy, uh, and that is that we remain committed to maintaining cross-strait peace and stability, uh, and our one China policy, which is guided, as you know, by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques, uh, and the six assurances. We, of course, don't have diplomatic relations to, with Taiwan or support Taiwan independence, but we have a robust, unofficial relationship, as well as an abiding interest in maintaining peace and stability uh, across the Taiwan Strait. Yes? Well, just before we move on from that, so you're saying that the State Department has no opinion about this potential visit? Uh, we don't have an opinion about a visit that hasn't been announced. Uh, it is not for us to weigh in on potential uh, potential travel or hypotheticals. Uh, we'll defer to the Speaker's office to speak to any plans she may have. Well, right, but I mean, she's spoken about the possibility of it. 
I believe her office has made very clear uh, that they don't confirm or deny uh, any potential travel. Yes. Just two follow-ups, one on uh, Ukraine's and Plan B. Uh, since when has it been under discussion? Since when has the Plan B or any other rounds? Well, I, I wouldn't call it a Plan B again because uh, we need to your uh, to put it uh, to put a finer point on it. Uh, the Ukrainians are seeking to utilize every viable route to export uh, grain and other foodstuffs. Uh, so the fact is that uh, we've always, uh, since uh, the start of Russia's aggression, uh, been working with our uh, Ukrainian partners, recognizing that Russia's brutality would exacerbate global food insecurity. So even if uh, and we hope this is the case if and when uh, Russia's, excuse me, Ukraine's Black Sea ports uh, are once again open and uh, Ukrainian and uh, other countries' ships uh, are able to uh, transit in and out, uh, there will still be a need for other uh, routes and paths, including uh, overland routes, uh, to maximize the level of export. So this is not an either or, uh, this is uh, and, uh, an and both situation. And also, um you mentioned uh, about the continuing export that has increased over the months. Can you uh, tell us if how much of it is from Odessa or from the south or from the east? Well, uh, when it comes to uh, maritime exports from, from Odessa, the fact is that Moscow has maintained an effective blockade uh, of the Black Sea ports. Land, land routes. I, I, I couldn't speak uh, precisely what it would need to defer to our Ukrainian partners to, to speak to. Another one on Iran. You said uh, the, the ball is now with Iran, and also you added that it has been several weeks we haven't heard back from Iranian uh, positive step uh, toward a deal. Till when are you going to wait for Iran to... We will pursue a mutual, uh, a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA for as long as it's in our national security interest. Uh, that is not something that we can attach a calendar date to precisely because we are always, and when I say we, I mean the collective we, the United States government, uh, is always taking a close look uh, at the underlying factors. In this case, it's primarily the advancements that Iran is making with its uh, nuclear program. Uh, one thing is very certain, uh, we will reach a point where the deal that's been on the tables for several months now uh, will not be in our interest. Uh, and we'll reach that point as soon as the advancements that Iran has made and is making uh, overtake the non-proliferation benefits uh, that the JCPOA would convey. Uh, final question, yes. Thank you. Um, we have a question about uh, review conference of NPT treaty on non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, uh, which will start next Monday. First, do you expect Secretary Blinken will attend the conference next week? And what do you think is the significance of review conference this time, especially in light of the Russia's threat to use nuclear weapons? And uh, what will the U.S. call for to make an international consensus during the review conference? Sure. Uh, so I'm not in a position to announce any travel uh, at the moment, but let me just say broadly uh, that uh, the United States uh, stands by uh, the uh, NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, we think it is uh, extraordinarily important uh, to underline uh, the obligations uh, that the NPT puts forward for uh, nuclear weapon states and for non-nuclear weapon states alike uh, in the face of challenges uh, to the global uh, non-proliferation regime. We think it's important that the United States uh, stands with uh, the signatories uh, of the NPT uh, to make clear that even though it has been uh, in effect for some time now, its relevance, its importance uh, has not diminished a single iota uh, over the years and over the decades. Uh, so without getting too far, I think you can expect Secretary Blinken to be personally uh, involved uh, in this effort, uh, including uh, in the coming days. Thank you all very much.